Over the past 20 years, the amount of time spent by managers and employees in collaborative or cooperative activities has bloomed by 50% or more. And it's going up and up and up. And this is one thing that technology is generating, is huge amounts of expectation that you can connect and collaborate with others. As I just had a meeting today uh, where I had four people from all different sites talking about a science project, trying to collaborate, and we can all use Skype to you know, log in and meet one another. How many people here have collaborated with somebody over some video chat service uh, in the last week that wasn't around immediately with you? Okay, so about half the audience. So this is something that just becomes on a weekly basis, we're doing more and more and more. Now I'm gonna tell you about the science of this. So how we study this, one of the ways at, in my lab at NYU, is looking at what factors actually get people on the same wavelength. So when you have a group of people trying to learn something, um, what are the factors that actually trigger everybody to be on the same wavelength? And that's something that historically has been hard to study because you can't know what's going on in each person's mind. And the tools that we had, asking people every so often how they feel, do they feel connected, are very intrusive. And so you need ways to measure this in real time online that aren't intrusive, that don't mess up what's going on in the group. And so what we've been doing is um, using remote EEG headsets so you can measure electrical activity across the scalp as entire groups are working together to solve problems, as kids are in classrooms trying to discuss an idea with a teacher or um, read something or watch a video together and see what is driving learning and engagement. And what we found is that when people are on the same wavelength, and by that I mean when their brains are literally firing the, in similar patterns, um, they tend to be more engaged. And this seems to be uh, something that's really important uh, you know, in every walk of life because more and more in workforces people are reporting being disengaged. Um, it turns out that what's called presenteeism, where you're at work but you're just disengaged from what you're doing, is more costly to companies than absenteeism, or pe when people call in sick and they're not sick or just don't come in or don't do their work. So getting engagement is critical, and it turns out there's certain things you can do to increase engagement. Uh, or sorry, getting people on the same wavelength. We found that when they're having a group discussion, they're much more likely to be on the same wavelength than when they're just hearing somebody lecture at them, like right now. So you're gonna be more engaged and on the same wavelength when we get to the questions uh, and discussion than you are just passively listening. Now, what predicts team success in the workforce? Uh, there's more and more research coming out on this all the time. And uh, a number of studies have found, uh, including a group at Carnegie Mellon and MIT did this great study, finding that when we think of what makes great teams, we might think of having the smartest person on a team matters a lot, or having a lot of smart people on a team. Those things matter, but it turns out not very much. When it comes to solving problems, uh, being creative, generating ideas, some teams are greater than the sum of their parts that there's this extra factor over and above just basic intelligence at the level of individuals called collective intelligence. And they found that teams that were diverse uh, were more collectively intelligent. And one of the reasons is because it promotes perspective taking. That if you're able to get in somebody's mind who's different than you and communicate to them in a way that gets it across to them, your idea, uh, those teams tend to be more successful and intelligent. Another uh, project on this that I think is one of the best was at Google. They, did, they looked at all 180 teams across the whole company, very data-driven organization, and they wanted to figure out what predicts team success. Is it personality types um, or the right skills or background? Or is it something about who goes out for drinks afterwards or just like knows each other from work or has really good friends on the team that they got assigned to? And they found that almost none of those things predicted team success. In fact, their conclusion was that Google were really good at finding patterns, but there weren't strong patterns here. The one thing they found that mattered for team success that set some teams apart from others was what's known as psychological safety. Now, psychological safety is not what you think of when you watch TV and hear people talking about students being safe on campus. What it actually means in teams is that you can actually challenge someone or be challenged. You can put out an idea that no one's ever tried before, something that's different from the status quo, and you won't be kicked off the team. And then if you're wrong, people still invite you to weigh in next time. And that's actually what, how they measure psychological safety, and that's what predicts team success. And so it seems clear across in real organizations, in controlled experiments in the lab, that some teams cooperate and coordinate better than others. Um, and that seems to be over and above just how smart the people are in the team. And so it seems like there is some issue about 
uh, not only is collaboration going, but growing, but it matters. And that aspects of connection that we can now measure scientifically uh, predict engagement and performance on these teams. So this suggests to me there's more and more evidence that cooperation and collaboration is going to become a bigger and bigger part of work um, as you move throughout your careers and that we're getting a better, better handle on how important it is.